Thank you. Um, I want to first acknowledge Kirk Rudy because uh, I really appreciate him giving us permission to laugh a little bit amidst this darkness. Though when I ask my wife, Mish, do you think it's okay if I crack a couple jokes in between my serious remarks? It's like, don't worry about it, you're not that funny anyway. <laughs> um, let's see. So on October 7th, humanity witnessed a day of pure, unadulterated evil, as President Biden described the Hamas massacre in the south of Israel. Then we witnessed throngs and masses of people across the world chanting, death to Jews, gas the Jews. And last night in Dagestan, Russia, a mob of thousands broke through an airport trying to find Jewish people and Israeli people on a plane. And the goal that ADL tasked me is to try to provide hope for the community. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, but in all seriousness, I have absolute conviction that five years from now, we're going to look back at this moment and realize that this was the cathartic period where we finally broke through the disease that has been taken to an entire society. Because anti-Semitism is just the first canary in the mind. It is a disease that's hitting all of us, the dehumanization of hatred, a bunch of different factors that are eating into this, are leading to anti-Semitism in unprecedented numbers. But it's a much, much deeper issue that it's all eating all of us. And I actually have enormous optimism that in the coming days and years, we're finally going to be mobilized to turn back the clock on all of that hate and look back at this month as the seminal period when that changed. So how the hell are we going to get there? Let me walk you through it, but before that, let me give you a little bit of background about myself. I was supposed to talk about Kind and share a little bit of the soft stories about how Kind became an iconic brand that doesn't just uh, do very financially well, but try to do something good for the world. Uh, Fortunately, the toolkit that helped us build KIND is the same toolkit that we've deployed to try to advance civic work to bring people together in the Middle East and here in the United States. So let me share with you first some of the work I've done in the Middle East by way of background. I first started a company called PeaceWorks right after law school to use business as a force for bringing people together. And we, for 25 years, brought Israelis Palestinians, Jordanians, Egyptians, and Turks to trade with one another. And the theory of economic cooperation is that as you work together, you shatter cultural stereotypes, you humanize one another, you create vested interest in preserving those relationships, and you give a stake in the system to all of Israel and its neighbors to work together rather than fight. I also built the One Voice Movement together with my uh, Palestinian Israeli co-founder, Mohammed Daraushe. Incidentally, Mohammed's cousin, Awad Daraushe, was assassinated by Hamas terrorists during um, this uh, October 7th massacre. Awad, a Muslim Israeli, was tending to victims of the music festival when the Hamas terrorists killed him too. They knew he was Muslim and they killed him. Uh, they don't look uh, at humanity the same way that we do. President Biden met Mohammed, and there's a picture of him um, giving him condolences. One Voice Today is the largest grassroots movement, not just on the Israeli side, but on the Palestinian side. Uh, it's Darkenu movement is the largest Israeli grassroots movement. It has hundreds of thousands of members, about half a million members. And it's a force for pursuing rule of law, democracy, and coexistence. And Zimam is the Palestinian counterpart across the West Bank and Gaza fighting to build bridges also and to encourage moderation. A lot of the people in our movement uh, suffered on October 7th and have been suffering till today. The Israeli chair of our movement, Darkenu, is Arshai. His son, Noni, 
was one of the three soldiers that were defending a village and when hundreds of people came attacking them and they killed him but he was able to defend that village and people were unharmed in that village. We know what happened in the other kibbutzim that didn't have people like Noni. Um, I could go on with a lot of other stories. We have Palestinian staff still today in Gaza trying to evacuate that we got them uh, access to try to evacuate but Hamas has not allowed them to get out. But in spite of that, our, I had a meeting with our Palestinian uh, partners on the ground, and they are as devastated as we are about the way Hamas has hijacked the conflict again. Uh, but they're com full of conviction that we're gonna f ultimately break the shackles that violent extremists and terrorists have placed in the region. One Voice was born in the aftermath of the breakdown of the Camp David negotiations. Uh, and the breakout of the violent intifada. Around the time, um, I was pretty paralyzed. Remember, I had started PeaceWorks in 1993. Seven years later, all of this violence breaks out. And I lived in New York City, and I was watching the news. And I was terrified. I couldn't understand. I was frankly quite depressed. Like, how could it be that, you know, I had all these Palestinian farmers and partners and people that I was working with on the ground. And all of a sudden, all the faces that I see are faces of extremism, of hatred, you know, Palestinians lynching Israelis in, 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 in a town. And I, I was frankly depressed. Months later, I gathered the courage to go and confront my friends. And I went to Ramallah, and I went to Gaza, and I talked to them, and I said, guys, what happened with all of you people? Why is going on? And they were furious at me. And they said, what are you talking about? Where are you people? And I'm like, what do you mean, where are my people? Let me show you my people. And I showed them pictures of my people. And they said, let, them, let us show you what we see. And then they turned on Al Manar television and Al Jazeera television and Al Arabiya television. And it was bone chilling and terrifying to see the way the Arab world saw Israelis and sees Israelis. It was terrifying because they only saw the worst of the other side. We, didn't, we have completely different narratives. It's at that point that I realized, wow, you know, moderates actually are the overwhelming majority. 30 years after I give you my word, the vast majority of Palestinians, the vast majority of Muslims, the vast majority of Arabs want a better future for their children and are very happy for Israelis to have a better future for theirs. It's not that they love the Israelis, but they don't want anything along the lines of what Hamas committed. They're embarrassed, and frankly, they suffer enormously from it too, because consequently there's Islamophobia, just like they unleash so much anti-Semitism. The problem is that we don't see the moderates, just like the Palestinians don't see the Israeli moderates. And if an overwhelming majority of moderates are here and here, but the only things that rise up are the things that go above the virtual and physical walls, and are the voices of hatred, each side assumes that the other side is represented by that monstrosity. So that's why we decided to build the One Voice Movement. It's at that time that we recognized that this is not, it cannot be seen as a conflict of Israelis versus Jews, or as you know, Muslims versus, I'm sorry, certainly not Israelis versus Jews, of Muslims versus Jews, or Palestinians versus Israelis, or the left versus the right. It is a conflict of moderates, versus extremists. But the problem is that while they are the overwhelming majority, moderates don't take action. And while extremists are the minority, they're very passionate. The extremists wake up in the morning and they think, how can I advance my cause? The moderates wake up in the morning and they think, what can I have for breakfast? And consequently, they hijack our lives. See, Michelle, that can be a little funny. Here and there. Um, please laugh a lot, because then I'll be able to prove Michelle wrong. <laughs> Only in the last three weeks, a friend of mine introduced me to a better framework than moderates versus extremists. It's builders versus destroyers. Moderates who take action are builders. Extremists who take action are destroyers. Destroyers want to destroy, divide, and diminish. Moderates 
want to build, builders will build, unite, and bring light to the world. It's essential for us to move all of us from being moderates to being builders. The common thread to all of my work is my father. I committed to build bridges to try to prevent what happened to my dad from happening again to others. My dad was nine years old when the war started and he was 15 and a half when he was liberated by American soldiers from the Dachau concentration camp. Tonight I want to focus you on one of the most difficult stories that I heard from my father when he was uh, going through those very, very dark years. It starts when the superintendent of his building, the war started when he was about nine years old, and around the age of 10, the superintendent of his building went to him and said, are you hungry? And my dad said, yes, I'm hungry. He said, come, I'll show you where you can get a bite to eat. And he drove, walked him downstairs, and he pointed him to a pile of dead bodies. And he said, those are Jews. Take a bite of one of them, you can have a bite. At some point later, the paramilitary forces rounded up all the Jewish families in the building where my family lived, and the superintendent walked door by door pointing out to the paramilitary forces where the Jewish families lived. When they got to my, and there's a, video of my father from the Holocaust archives that I uh, digitized, it's on my YouTube channel if you wanna see the whole interview. It's very, very interesting and very important to, to listen to it. You can look at a Roman Lubetsky um, Holocaust interview. Um, my dad was a little kid so he didn't understand what was going on then but they took my grandmother into the back and presumably they raped her. And then afterwards, they walked them downstairs and they lined them up and just as they were about to kill them, the superintendent talked to the head of the paramilitary forces and whispered something into his ear. And they left. And the superintendent turned to my grandfather and said, Mr. Lubetsky, you were always kind to me. You always treated me with respect. You always looked at my eyes when I was walking up or down and you saw me and you always gave me my bottle of schnapps and my tip on the holidays. So I'm sparing your family, but leave now before I change my mind. And that night my family grabbed a couple of belongings and moved to the Kovno Ghetto. Why is this story so important? Because this was not a good person. And yet in the darkest of moments, he managed to find a shred of humanity and spared my family's life. A few days ago, you may have seen this video of an elderly Israeli when she was released by the terrorists in an exchange. My sister called me and she said, did you see that video? And I said, no, I didn't. She's like, he was? Very strange, because this elderly 80-year-old lady turned and he shook the hands of her Hamas captor and looked at his eyes. And I think there was a moment of humanity there, she said. And I said, Ileana, you know, terrorists put these hostages through a harrowing experience. And she knows that there's other people that are still held hostage. And she doesn't have control over her faculties. There's no humanity in that moment or in that person. But then I went and I looked at the video myself. And I encourage you guys to look at it. It's a fascinating moment because the Red Cross officials trying to guide her to move on. And she turns to say goodbye to her captor. And the Red Cross official, well-intentioned, wants to prevent her from having to humiliate herself one day. But she pushes herself away from that, turns to her Hamas captor, shakes his hand and looks at his, at his eyes 
with enormous moral strength. And it's as if she's telling him, discover your humanity. We're all human beings. Remember what I told you when you were holding me captive and be a human being and respect the people that you're keeping behind. And that moment, you know, all of us have probably watched countless videos that have made us cry. Yesterday I was with one of the most important leaders in our community uh, and he told me that every morning he wakes up and he cries. And I'm sure a lot of us have had those moments, but this video, interestingly, has stayed with me and provided me a, a modicum of hope, but a very, very important moment because it's, it's fascinating the power that she had over her captor who was like several feet taller than her and had a pretty big Kalashnikov. Um, that was not supposed to be a joke, but please joke, so like my wife gives me credit. Um, we need to dismantle the Hamas infrastructure. There is no way to build hope and to build a better future for the Palestinian people and for the Israeli people if we allow these monsters to stay in power. We need to dismantle the Hamas terrorist infrastructure. And as we do so, we need to make the greatest effort we can to show kindness to the civilians wherever we can. I'm not in the IDF forces. I have a lot of friends that are on the front line sacrificing. So I do not know how we dismantle that Hamas infrastructure while minimizing any innocent Israeli lives or Palestinian lives. But as a goal, we have to try to dismantle the forces of terror while strengthening the voices of peace. Mm -hmm. This is, thank you. I would really appreciate if instead of clapping, you just laugh because I want my wife to. <laughs> um, this was the formula from the former prime minister, Itzhak Rabin. We need to fight terrorism as if there is no peace and to pursue peace as if there is no terror. Because the terrorists and the forces of hate are going to try to derail us, and we cannot allow them to derail us. So 30 years from the moment when I started PeaceWorks, 20 years from when we started the One Voice Movement, where do we stand today? There's definitely reason to be sobered up. Sobered up. You look at the college campuses, and by the way, it's very, very important to remember that the, these people do not represent even remotely a significant number of the campus. Like at Stanford, where I've been very, very active talking to all of the leadership, there's 200 activists saying things that are not nice, that are very, very unkind, uh, that are very inhumane, but there's 17,000 students. And we just need to keep this in perspective because social media, in some ways, is an incredible tool for the divide, divisive forces. Social media algorithms start spreading all of the hate. And what's worse, we are diminishing and consume ourselves as because we're all seeing our own all these videos of horror, but the people that need to see them are in denial or they don't want to see them. So we need to do this smarter. Don't Definitely be educated, but be strategic also, because if we are all held down in shackles by all of the videos of monstrosities for the entire day, we're not going to be able to build. We're not going to be able to bring light. We need to be aware of what happened. We need to bring light to what happened and, and remember and, and remind others and show it in strategic ways. But we cannot just continue being consumed by it forever, because we have to start building. Um, but there's a lot of challenges in college campuses. The anti-colonialist ideology is so rigid. It's an us versus them ideology. We're going to need to bring in hundreds of Israeli and Palestinian moderates from our movement and others. There's, there's thousands of groups that are pursuing peace on both sides. We're working with them to bring them to the campuses to share an alternative. Because you know what? The extremists that are calling from the river to the sea they're condemning their people to an eternal battleground. They're not helping the Palestinian people. They're certainly not helping the Israeli people, they're causing anti-Semitism, but they're also preventing this conflict from getting resolved because Israelis are never 
going to allow people that want to destroy them to take over. So anybody that uses violent absolutism as an ideology is actually causing harm to their own people. And we need to remind people about that. Um, another thing that still concerns me a lot where, where we need to be very, very concerned is the influence of the Islamic Republic, the, the regime that's repressing the Iranian people and exporting its jihadist ideology across the Middle East. They've been doing that ever since they rose to power in 1979. I don't think they're going to change their mind. As much as I want to believe that everybody can be a force of good, their ideology of a cult of death, of an Islamic caliphate is so extremist, uh, we need to be aware of that and we need to stand against it. And we need to stand against the enormous rises and anti-Semitism, which was already happening well before this event, and then it just showed its ugly head and read it even in a greater fashion lately. But there's a lot of reason to be hopeful. 30 years ago and 20 years ago, when these things happened, we did not have moral clarity from the Arab leaders ruling their countries. It was much more us versus them. Today, the Saudi kingdom is doing everything it can to root out its own extremists within its own midst in its own kingdom. It has tried to neutralize and relegate the Wahhabi sect to a, a minor role. It started stopping the export of jihadist ideology. It's wanting to build a better future for the region. It was trying to do a peace deal with the Israelis that the Iranians tried to derail. In Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood had risen to power. The Egyptian people saw what they sought to do, and they banned it. Hamas is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's banned in Egypt. We have the Abraham Accords with peace with Bahrain. The Bahraini foreign minister just yesterday talked about how this should be a conflict of builders versus destroyers. He li literally used the same language. And within Israel, Muslim voices have more moral clarity than I've ever witnessed. I've been working in this space for 30 years. A lot of my Muslim friends were intimidated to speak up. Today, you hear them very clar clearly and uh, condemning the terrorist massacre, very clearly speaking about, against that ideology. And uh, we need to help those voices get out because they're not being heard enough, but they're absolutely committed to be heard. And there's enormous amount of good things happening in Israel and among Palestinian entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs that want to build a better future. We just need to unleash it. We need to break the shackles of extremists that have held us hostage for far too long in order to try to start bringing light to the world. Um, even in campuses, I'm seeing a lot of progress that we hadn't seen for decades, because this took many, many years to build into what it is today, and it's going to take many years to change it. But there's an enormous goodwill, and it all starts with us, literally. This is an organization called Starts With Us that we founded here in the United States a few years ago, and that already has two million followers. And its goal is to try to replace that rigid, rigid dehumanization that has eaten up all of America over the last several years and replace it with curiosity, compassion, and courage. Curiosity, particularly towards those ideas that you might not be leaning to agree with, compassionate towards those different from you, and the courage to work across lines of difference to solve problems. In order to solve problems, we need to be critical thinkers, we need to be critical listeners, we need to introduce a problem-solving mentality and replace those rigid ideologies with that. And that all brings me back to kind, because the three C's from Starts With Us, we drew them from our experiences at kind, where we tried to create an environment where people could have respectful disagreements, where the entrepreneurial system relied on the same thing that the American spirit relies, respectful, hearty disagreement, and kindness. Kindness is the oil that lubricates the machine of democracy. It's the essential tool to allow us to work well together. And sometimes kindness is misunderstood 
as weakness because people confuse it with being nice. Now, there's nothing wrong with being nice, but kindness is very different. You can be nice and it be passive. It doesn't require strength. But kind requires action. It requires enormous amount of strength and courage. You can be nice and be polite, but kindness requires you to be honest. For example, if you see, we're sitting earlier today with somebody that ate some of that kimchi, <laughs> and you are experiencing like, oh my god, this person's breath is killing me. <laughs> if you're nice, you just step back one foot or two. But if you're kind, you offer them a piece of chewing gum. <laughs> um, if you're nice, you don't bully others. But if you're kind, you stand up to the bullying. You stand up to the bullying. You stand up against hatred. You stand up against racism. You stand up against anti-Semitism. You stand up against hatred or injustice against any human being. If you're nice, you don't cause problems. But if you're kind, you work to solve problems. Most of us are not bullies. Most of us are not the media trolls or the loudest voice in the room. Me a little bit sometimes. But the vast majority of people in the world, business leaders, team members, parents, friends, citizens, they don't create problems, but they aren't the ones getting them solved either. This is very problematic because a world in which nice people stand on the sidelines is a world in which evil ultimately wins. What is referred to in political speech as the quiet majority almost always, unwillingly, winds up on the wrong side of history. When instead, the majority musters the courage to stand against anti-Semitism and other forms of hate, then humanity has a chance to prevail. Kindness from others kept my father alive during the Holocaust. And despite what my father went through, he never failed to see the humanity in every human being. That's why we call the company kind. That's why we named it kind after my father. The humanity and strength contained in my dad's spirit is the same humanity that I see guiding ADL. ADL's mission to fight anti-Semitism and all forces of hatred and defama defamation against any human being or group is what drew me to join the board. Extremism begets extremism. Hatred begets more hatred. We need to build alliances to find all, to fight all defamation and injustice everywhere, including the particular pernicious anti-Semitism that has exploded over the last several years and that has shown its ugliest face this month. Now more than ever, we need to stand for all humanity against all forms of hatred. We need to fight hate for good. It's not enough that all of us gathered today are moderates. We're all nice moderates. We need to be builders. We need to be problem solvers. We need to be kind. Thank you.